I'm a teacher's voice, so. <laughs> Um, let me start by saying that um, I, I, I want to ask, I think when we come to a conference, we're not just here to listen to other people talk, because we can do that on YouTube or get on Skype, but we're here to meet other people and the tea breaks are important. So by a show of hands, there's been lots of conversation about Prezi here. How many people in the room have actually used a Prezi themselves? All right, okay. This is, well, oh, <laughs> I so for, I'm assuming for a number of people in the room, you're seeing it for the first time. Well, I actually set myself a challenge. I have this and two more slides. Because I'm trying to use Prezi not as a PowerPoint, but as a social constructivist approach where I said to Bob, let me go last, and I will listen furiously to the three preceding talk or people speakers, and then I'll try to pull it together with some of the ideas that I had. So we've been talking about the kinds of things you can do with technology and learning spaces and environments. I'm going to be looking at what it takes to get those, which is the human side and how we get the humans to move and change in the first place. And I'm going to start by saying, what does it take? And it's something all the people up here know. And it's the things that you all know often by frustration in your jobs. Because if you're here, you obviously care. Is you're trying to get other people to come along with you. What do you need? You need money. You need people to do it who may or may not have the skills right now. And you need a spirit of commitment, often fueled by some kind of concern. Like I heard you speak about how the students demanded a different kind of learning space. And I'm not at all surprised that the number of students entering the library in Hong Kong remains stable because our students don't have other places to study in Hong Kong. That's particular to our Hong Kong content. So, first slide, I'm going to ask you to think about other technologies. And if we loosely define technologies, the things that we use in our daily life, let's look at the way technology or the, the way things change in our lives. Here is how we eat. And what do we commonly eat with? Dishes. And if you look across the, la the, next, the last 200 years, what do you find? Things haven't changed much. If I wanted to, I could have gotten the blue willow pattern and had the same pattern across all of these. Okay? And some of them are even still made by the same companies. Right? Those are the expensive good ones. Right? We pay more for the old stuff. Who wants a 1972 computer? Will you pay more for that? Okay. okay, things don't have to change. We can have styrofoam, there can be variations, but not a big deal. Let's think about another area in our daily lives, transportation. Have things changed in 200 years? If you look across here, part of what's happening though is we started with the horseless carriage. And we used to get outside of the car and crank it in the front. And we decided it might be nice to start it from the inside. And when we started going faster, we realized a windshield would be a really good idea, right? And so things changed to the point that here doesn't look that much like here, but it took a couple hundred years, or easily 50, 60, 80. Oh, I don't want to click that button. I want to go to the next one down here. Communication. These might be a little hard to see. 1800s, telegram. How many people have ever sent a telegram in their life? Raise your hand. <laughs> no. I sent one in the early 80s when I was in Hong Kong and my, my roommate was getting married in the US. I couldn't afford to, to, to make a long distance phone call. We had phones. Notice they still have cords. Here we have something that everybody except for three people in the room carry with them, right? And what's happening now is we not only use it to talk to each other one-to-one, -one, but we can get on the internet. We can access other things. We have our smartphones. We have our Androids. We have our iPhones. The way we communicate is changing, and arguably changing faster than the previous two. <coughs> computing. I had to think here for a while. I think a lot of people who've learned about computing, this is 1950s, I, I was thinking of getting the UNIVAC picture, which where it was a whole room with the wires. You know, that's about World War II. A computing, we probably, I never didn't compare this, but we probably have more computing capability in our iPhones than that mm -hmm. room had. I'd like to double check that sometime. 
And I tried to think about the same time span. What did I have to do to get something in the same time span? I had to go back to an abacus, if I went back this far. And this is a certain kind of adding machine that was mechanical, that was available around the 1900s. We started adding electricity, but what happens? By now, we're getting very portable, and we're putting computing skills in everybody's hands all the time. Education. These photos are little. I resisted the temptation to look for all blue willow pattern dishes. But what I would put to you, here, here's students in a, in a classroom with a blackboard, and here are students at desks, and then there's, in the 1950s, we kind of have another kind of view of that. Here we have what? In the, even the 2000s. If you look online, even if you have students using computers, it's still in sort of a desk format, isn't it? Right? But what I would ask you to think about, and here's where I hope I can get this to work properly. I'm trying to scan that out and go next, next to it. Uh, I won't let me do it. I'm trying to get into this whole area. I'll do this. And then I want to get out of it. What I want to do is I want to go back here. And if we put it all together, which one does this look most like? Maybe, or more likely, somewhere up here. We don't change education very quickly. And this is where some of our speakers have said things. Like Ian was saying about technology without changing pedagogy doesn't make much sense. And I would put forward the argument that usually we think of using technology to do what we already are doing. So if I go in here, here's some advice, depending upon different speakers. These are some ideas of where we can go. Learning from our ancestors, we should be thinking, there's, uh, I think it was Carl Sant Santanagana who said, if we don't learn from history, we are doomed. Oh. If we don't learn from our ancestors, we're doomed to repeat it. So what can we learn about human nature and about how you make changes happen? Because you need will, you need people, you need money. You can even learn from Sun Tzu in the Art of War or Machiavelli's Prince because you need to use leadership to make things happen on a large scale. Did somebody just come in and talk to you, um, Peter, and say, I'd like to give you several million dollars for changing something in the library? to be honest and say yes. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> not all of it. Not all of it. Let me uh, Okay, go ahead. Well, we, we, uh, we, did, we, we did the obligatory application to AA and I UGC funding. Mm -hmm. Asked for a certain amount, they gave us half. Mm -hmm. Then this donor, um, so I'll top you up some, some, so that you can enhance the experience and the environment. Okay. So someone did give us a little somebody, bit. Some, somebody <laughs> did. But also probably because people are starting to feel behind if you don't have something like that. Well, he saw students sitting on, on the floor in groups with, mm -hmm. with cables dragging. Mm -hmm. that, that's precisely his There's point. a clear need driving it. Uh, there's some other things here. I mean, there's classic ideas. But also, Thomas Kuhn, paradigm shifts. Okay? We need a paradigm shift that says people need to learn differently and operate differently. And if we're currently using technology to do what we've always done, it's about like how we use a, how we use a car, how we use a, a dish. Right? Coming back out again, and this worked on my computer at home. We also have the idea of you have to leverage on these trends. It's, a, it's time to have learning spaces and so forth. Are we as educators only looking at education? Or are we looking for other resources that help stimulate us? And here I have things like the Horizon Report. How many people here have heard of the Horizon Report? Okay. It's a great place to look as an educator because it's a think tank where they get together and they tell you these are two or three technologies that are implementable within a year to two years. Then there's a mid-range and about five years out. And you can see mobile computing is coming closer and closer until it becomes a more current one. I have the Wall Street Journal here because as educators, what is it? We're not so used to making money, are we? We're here to help people. We don't want a drug for the bottom dollar. Guess what? There are a lot of good ideas out there in the innovative business world that can help us do the actual business of education 
better than we sometimes do. YouTube, Harvard Business Review, it doesn't matter where ideas come from, but we also have to keep them modern. I'd like to focus in on a couple other areas. We do need to also dream and get some crazy ideas. Don't be afraid to give it a try. I'm going to begin this by suggesting, let's see. I, I have some other comparisons of classrooms. <coughs> this one, which I think other, other presenters have also talked about. <coughs> Most of the time, things haven't changed that much, even when you bolt on the technology. You get the same kind of classroom. We need to pay attention to the people in the contexts. We think that if we have a new thing that we're going to do, we can get people excited and it's going to change things. But actually, you have to change the people. And you have to work at it longer and harder than you usually think, so think about it. It's more about the people than the technology. And there are various types of change, of responses to change and barriers. For example, and this is one of the people that we need to learn from in history, is Rogers' diffusion of, education, of, of innovation. And this also applies to convincing people they need to boil their water so they don't get sick. Right? That we have our, early, our innovators and our early adopters in the early majority. Where are we with these things? Okay. We have probably the innovators at the front, and we've all heard of Prezi, but a lot of us are using it for about the first time, including me, for a, for a formal presentation. So how do we bring people to cost? Roger's traditional idea has been updated by somebody called Moore, who talks about crossing the chasm, who says you can get a certain percentage of people on board with something, and then it gets really hard. And there has to be a leap with extra energy to get people across the leap, or a government decree, or a lot of money put into it, or in the case of the US in the early 1960s, Russia getting somebody up and orbiting the Earth before the US. So that we had to we had to get to the moon. And I forgot about how much time I had left. One, okay, minus one. <laughs> so you need to frame you need to frame really powerful questions that are more about the why and worry less about the how. And you need to pay attention to those people in context. Because some things will work one place and not another. I'm going to try to go all the way back out. Yeah, yeah, I'm trying to go without that. This is about dreaming and celebrating. Uh, I'm going to go to. Uh, well, I'm going to stop with this instead of going out to the main one. Okay, okay. <laughs> <laughs>